It's about the discipline execution on a day-by-day basis. It's not some big play. It's not get lucky. It's not talent. It's win the day. And when you win the day, you win tomorrow. And when you win tomorrow, you win the next day. There's actually no upper ceiling when it comes to that. It's not talent. It's not skill. It really is. How long do you want to execute? And at what level do you want to execute? We see all of these crazy successes. And of course, yeah, there, there's lightning striking in a bottle or whatever you call it. Or yeah, it does happen. The pans. Yeah. There's these things that happen, dude. But the people that are at the top, the people that get to, to those lofty places, it really is just normal everyday people doing normal everyday things as disciplined as possible and and not being afraid to take the long road to yeah. take the hard road yeah. brick by boring brick we do it every single day when you stand at your greatest moment of opportunity or your darkest hour you have to be able to answer that question did i do enough am i enough and you are enough if you've done the little things leading up to it What is up, guys? It's Andy Purcell, and this is the show for the realists say goodbye to the lies, the fakeness, and delusions of modern society, and welcome to motherfucking reality. Guys, today, instead of our uh, normal Cruise the Internet episode, we have uh, a special guest. I'm going to get right into it. Let's do it. Yeah. Michael Chandler. My What's man. up, bro? Dude, living the dream, dude. I just got the tour of the HQ here. Absolutely ridiculous. So pumped up to be here, man. Thanks, bro. It's so good to see you, man. You too, man. Yeah. It's awesome. So a lot of you guys may or may not know, but Michael and I grew up 10 minutes from each other. Mm -hmm. And uh, we've been trying to connect for years. Yep. And uh, dude, it's really cool to finally have you here, especially after the big announcement this weekend. Crazy. 48 hours ago, dude. Yeah. What yeah, you so I texted you right after. I was like, hey, Monday's about to be lit. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> what, what was the big announcement? There's this, there's this, <laughs> yeah, there's this <laughs> fight. <laughs> yeah, there's this little thing. We little, little, yeah, this don't worry, we'll thing. get into it later. Yeah, right, right, yeah, right. Yeah, we'll yeah. gloss over it. <laughs> so, dude, um, how are you feeling about everything? Dude, honestly, you know, I've kind of made the joke. Um, I really have been in a very unique position the last, it's been about 16 months, really, you know. Got done with my last fight in November of 2022. Uh, January, I get a phone call. Hey, you want to do the ultimate fighter against Conor McGregor? We fight it right after the season. My answer, of course, is absolutely. We do the ultimate fighter. And then since the fight, the show wrapped up in August, um, we've kind of just been gone back and forth. So I feel like I called it MMA purgatory. I've kind of been, I've waited too long to not stay on the train of fighting Conor. I've had enough behind the scenes indications that the fight's definitely happening even though media even though the fans even though everybody's like this fight's never happening he's never coming back so honestly it's a huge weight lifted off my shoulders that we can finally talk about it i've known for months that the fight was going to be june 29th um Shit. but wasn't exactly public about it and uh now we can talk about it now the cat is out the bag and we got 75 hard days between Dude, right now we, <laughs> we were talking about this this morning so he sends me a text at like 6 a.m and he's like, bro, I was going to tell you later, but do you know how many days it is until my fight? And I'm like, no. And he's like, 75 days. And That's I'm like, crazy. holy shit, days. man. Yeah, the, the fact that I'm That's sitting so right crazy. here with the godfather of 75 hard is, and now we are, we're about to go into this training. I mean, I've already kind of started, but yeah. the fact that it got announced and uh, this is the first Monday uh, after it gets announced, yeah. 75 days, man, just a dream come true. It's going to well, be exciting. I, I told you, bro, I'm going to go hard, as hard as I can. For, I'm already on, I'm like day 30 on 75 right now, but I'm just going to finish that out and do phase one uh, so I can be done on the same day you're done. Yeah, yes, so I'll dude. be done on fight day. Dude, let's go, man. Yeah, this is so I'll be... be doing it with you. Not the same stuff, obviously. Well, I mean, yeah, I might close. have DJ punch me in the face. A couple times. <laughs> yeah, there you go. You got a couple yeah, sparring sessions, yeah. man. You guys got you got a you got a full basketball court over there. You got the gyms. Yeah. I heard there was some mats, but you had to clear them out for some. Yeah, events, they're so. usually right there next to the court. Yeah, the guys train uh, jujitsu there every. Uh, I don't know. Tuesday and Thursdays. Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, seven. Yeah, dude, so, so crazy, man. Yeah, man. So, dude, how did this all the 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 fight? I mean. Was there a lot of negotiation or was it pretty much like, okay, we could do this? I uh, I already kind of had my stuff set up because I, I had the foresight to negotiate with the UFC. Hey, here's my contract, but if I fight Connor, here's my contract. And we came to an agreement. Um, so it's kind of already been set and I'm very happy with it. And lo and behold, obviously that fight happened. The UFC knew about my contract. They were completely okay with it all happening. And the UFC is awesome, man. They... 
they have been absolute dream to work with behind the scenes, even though there's been so much craziness going on. You know, I mean, just for a quick timeline of people who haven't really followed it all. There was the big, you know, the drug testing thing because Connor was outside of USADA, the drug testing pool, mm -hmm. and that was a big hang up. Then he got into the USADA testing pool. Then they switched drug testing agencies. Now he's going to be in the new drug testing agency for six months. Um, so it's just been. How know, do they test you for that? Is it it's consistently completely random? So I got a, I got my location on my phone. So my mm -hmm. location, they know where my location is. Technically, they could call me right now, and I have basically two hours as the time limit. If you mm -hmm. don't show up to where they are or them to you mm -hmm. in a two hour time frame, you get a whereabouts failure. Um, you do get three. You know, you, it's not like a one and done. You get suspended. But if you do three whereabouts failures, you get suspended for the, the minimum two years. Mm. Um, so wow. it's completely random. We are under. We're still under WADA. So it's the same thing the NCAA. NFL, NHL, MLB uses, I believe. Um, yeah, and it's completely random, and here we are. Dude, Jeez. now, it's it's been cool to watch you come up and do your thing, especially being a, a fellow St. Louisan, right? Missourian. Uh, Missourian. Yeah. Yeah. You know, yeah, every time we talk, it's always a conversation about two – freaking redneck missouri dudes <laughs> putting it together man dudes that weren't supposed to be here and so yeah. here we are like what do we, i guess we'll keep going and it's been really cool bro to follow your career and see you come up and see you do what you've what you've been doing and, mm -hmm. and what you're gonna do um i mean when you when you think back and you think like you know growing up in in house springs and high ridge you know which isn't exactly you know for people that don't know it's 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 uh, it's not poor. It's just no, yeah, it's, it's, a, it's regular yeah, America, yeah. regular America, yeah. middle class, yeah, lower and middle class, midwestern, you know, yeah. place. And uh, you know, <clears throat> to be where you are right now, I mean, it's fucking awesome, dude. And like, yeah. when you think back to like all, like, did you ever? I think this is might be a silly question, but I just got to ask it. I mean, did you ever think like? This is where you wanted to end up, or, or or how did this all play out for you? No, I mean honestly, I didn't. I didn't even know professional athlete. Like for me to be a professional athlete, never really thought about it. I don't really think I ever. You know, first of all, I was four foot eleven, a hundred pounds in high school. Yeah. Going into high school, I wasn't going to be the star quarterback. I wasn't going to be playing basketball. Yeah. Um. So I knew I had to wrestle. Wrestled one hundred and three pounds. Um. So I never really thought about profession being a professional athlete, man. But the, so the fact that I've been a professional athlete now for sixteen years and had the success I've had is is just crazy. Um. And then in the sport of wrestling, there's really no path after. I mean, mm -hmm. you can maybe go to the Olympics and mm -hmm. that, but that's not. It's professional or athletics style or something. Yeah, it's right. professional athletics, kind of, but it's not a it's not a big glory thing. You know, it's 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 training for the Olympics, and I yeah. was never going to be able to do that. Um. But yeah, wrestled at Northwest High School, uh, was never never a state champ, um, and truth be told, nobody really wanted me at the Division One level. Um, I had I had some scholarship offers from some local schools, Lindenwood, Central Missouri State, mm -hmm. Missouri Baptist, uh, but for some reason, something in me said, hey, if I'm going to wrestle, I'm going to try to wrestle at the highest level, and I took a chance, and I walked on to Mizzou, mm -hmm. and coach didn't know my name. Coach Brian Smith is still there. You know, he didn't really look at me the, for the first year. Um, Ended up after my first year, I got a starting starting spot. But I went to I went to the University of Missouri, completely okay with riding the bench for five years if I had to, um, going through all the workouts, never never reaching the pinnacle, which would be becoming an All American, the Division One level. Mm -hmm. um, but so I took that chance on myself, walked on, and ended up becoming an All American, captain of the team, four year uh, four year starter, four year national qualifier for Mizzou, um, and then. Friends of our Tyron Woodley, mm -hmm. Ben Askren, mm -hmm. wrestled with both of those guys. They were kind of like my big brothers. I'm the yeah. oldest of three boys, so I didn't have older guys to look up to a lot. Those were the kind of the first big brothers I had, and they started fighting, and uh, ended up graduating in May of 2009. Fought my first fight at Lake of the Ozarks at some Holiday Inn ballroom down at Lake of the Ozarks. <laughs> uh, I got paid 500 bucks, and after we that's paid, that's a for, win. After we paid for hotel, after we paid for travel and gas and food, I think I lost like 38 bucks. Yeah, uh, so I was negative for the you know, but that's how you kind of get going. And then, man, then through Bellator and now in the UFC and now fighting the biggest combat sports athlete of all time, Connor. Dude, here, that's crazy. 75 days. So So how many fights did it take you to go from like fighting in the in the bars? Cause dude, yeah. we all know what that's like. Cause yeah. that's like a big thing around here, man. Yeah. We all love to go watch the local tickets and they're and they're fun. You watch them. they're they're fun and you're you're seeing people 
fighting at at kind of that 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 level where it's like, dude, I just want to get somewhere, and I yeah. gotta, I got to fight my tail off to. They're fighting more than just the opponent. Yeah. yeah, yeah, dude, for sure. I mean, and, I love the local level fights. Yeah. yeah, no, they're always fun, man. Yeah. Fun and character filled, and the crowd, and it's just, dude, it's it's like it's the the epitome of you know, kind of just at, at beer drink, beer drinking parties yeah. with your buddies, and they're like yeah. a fight breaks out, and you're like, let's go, man. Yeah, yeah. So, dude, how how long did it take you to go from that to Bellator? Man, I I got. I got to say, I, I have a very, very fortunate path when it came to that. I had that first, I only had one local show, mm -hmm. really. One local show, Lake of, the, Lake of the Ozarks, Missouri. It's still on YouTube. Um, awesome. I fought a guy named Kyle Swadley, who wrestled at Lindenwood. I think he was 1-0 at the time. It was first blood promotion. And uh, then they, you know, as you know, because you, you've probably seen some of the Strike Force fights that come mm -hmm. to town or Bellator, they... Um, partner with a local promoter and the local promoter finds local talent because how do you sell tickets? You get a guy like me who's got 200 something people from High Ridge, Missouri and I can sell uh, tickets to them and that's how you put butts in seats and sell out the arenas. So I fought Strike Force undercard, Strike Force undercard, one in Kansas City, one in St. Louis and then I had a, I had a moment where they said I had a Strike Force offer and I had a Bellator offer but to me Strike Force was kind of just a a big wide open net of, Hey, you're signing with the organization and then you're going to get some fights and then eventually maybe fight for the title. If you get good enough or you are good enough, but Bellator had a, a clear path. Cause back then they used to do, do a tournament. So I fought, um, two fights in two or three months. And then I got the go ahead to say, if you win these first two fights, you'll be in the tournament. Then I got in the tournament. I fought, fought March, April, May. So I fought three fights in three months. And then I fought Eddie Alvarez, who was the number three guy in the world at the time. So I somehow go from, May of 2009 to November 2011, and I'm fighting for a world title against the number three guy in the world. So it was just a crazy, crazy meteoric rise, really. And I had finished most of my opponents. I think I'd finished nine of my, or sorry, eight of my nine fights and like mm -hmm. seven of those in the first round. And then I had a knockdown drag out war with Eddie, ended up beating him. And it, uh, so it was very, very quick, honestly, which is, which was awesome. It was a huge blessing, but there was there were some growing pains that I had to go through because I, I hadn't some sometimes it's the right path but it's a little bit too quick right sometimes mm -hmm. it's, you're the right guy you're just not the right guy yet mm -hmm. and I think I I used the the training that I had all those years through fighting and I looked across the cage against Eddie Alvarez who had like thirty fights at the time or twenty something fights and I'm like dude I'm gonna I'm gonna beat this guy I know I'm gonna beat him and I go out there and I beat him and then you know later on I had a couple losses and it's been little ups and downs here but it's it's constantly continued to grow and it's mm -hmm. so it was a very cool path and. Uh, you know, being outside the UFC for so long, coming over to the UFC and then getting a title shot, my second fight and, you know, fight in the promotion mm -hmm. um, was part of kind of that buildup that led me to where we are today. Did you have to handle the crowd pressure during that time? Like that fast track? Did you ever have any like self doubt of like, do I belong here? Or was it, did you kind of just, were you able to block out the noise? I'll tell you what it was. And, and, because I I can I stand firm on knowing that I live a champion lifestyle more than anybody else I have ever met in the sport of mixed martial arts, and that's nothing against anybody else. There's other guys who do it right. I just truly believe I do it better and I do it different and more attention to detail. But I was building up this body, I was doing all the physical things, um, but I wasn't really taking care of the mindset part of things. I wasn't real. I wasn't really winning the battle between the ears. And you do start to feel the pressure. You do start to hear hear the doubt or you do start to drink your own Kool-Aid of, Hey, he's the next big thing. Cause right. I, I beat Eddie Alvarez and then immediately like, well, that's cool. He beat Eddie Alvarez. He's a top five guy in the world, but we want to see him fight Anthony Pettis in the UFC. We want to see him fight Benson Henderson, who were the yeah. champions at the time. And you start to feel this pressure. And I started to get this, I started to get this so much pressure put on myself to be perfect. Right. Cause you win the world title. You're you in your mind, you know, you earned it but you don't really know if you deserved it. Maybe it was too quick. So then I had my first loss to Eddie, uh, coincidentally, lost the rematch, and then I lost three fights in a row, 688 days. I went without winning a fight. So, and for those that do follow the sport or don't follow the sport, that's kind of like a career death sentence for mm -hmm. a fighter losing three fights in a row. Um, so I did. I started to feel that pressure. I started to, because once you win a world title and everyone's looking at you, now it's not just, hey, I'm going to go in. I'm going to have fun today, right? If you and me, me and you are going, I could beat you for four minutes and 50 seconds of a round. But if I lose 10 seconds of a round, to me, that was a failure. Mm -hmm. So I failed every single day. And when you when you feel like you're failing every single day, when you're really not, it's all about perspective. Mm -hmm. 
I felt like I was failing every single day. Every single day wasn't a day to get better and have fun and enjoy this beautiful life that I get to live. It was either, hey, I'm perfect or I'm a loser. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm a perfect, I'm going to mm -hmm. dominate everybody or I'm a failure. And uh, so I kind of fell into that trap. And, and right now, I, I was I, back then I was sad, I was depressed, I was upset, I was mad, I was all the emotions. But now I look back at that and think, man, I had to go through that. I had to be forged in it that major. Fire. Yeah, yeah, I had to, man, and and it, and now it's made me a better fighter. It's 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 propelled me to where I am. I'm a better husband because of it, a better father because of it, a better businessman, just a better man because of it. Yeah, people don't stop to think, you know, when you're pushing to be great or pushing to be the best at what you do, you're going to. It's always. It feels like you're losing. It feels like you're struggling, right? Because you're pushing the boundaries and the boundary to push it. You you have all these setbacks and all these doubts. Like when you lose three fights in a row, bro, that's a mental, mm. that's a mental battle. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? And people sometimes think that like winning and moving forward feels good, but it doesn't ever feel good. It no. always feels like a major struggle. I, I think of the times when I've elevated in my life, dude, and they've been the hardest times of my life, no doubt. Like, no doubt. Yeah. But like you said, dude, it's what teaches you everything you need to know. Yep. You know? It, yeah. And, and when you and when you have a, a, a setback or a loss, you mm -hmm. know, I, I talk about these three big mistakes that I made, too, you know, it, right away. And, and it was partly because, you know, you kind of you start to hear hear all the chatter and hear all the noise. But but until something bad happens and you're like, oh, I knew it. There I knew it, is. it. What they said. There yep. it is. They were yep. all right. When really they weren't. Yeah. Right. It, but it was my perception of it, right? So I, I immediately, I wanted to hide from everybody. I got, I got offered to come out and present the or present an award at the World MMA Awards for Fight of the Year and all the different stuff. Wasn't answering my phone. I wanted to hide from it, right? Now, man, I wear my losses on, I wear my losses on my sleeve. I'm almost proud of them. I'm almost, I'm almost just proud to be in, to be the man in the arena, mm -hmm. right? And not almost. I am proud to be that man in the arena because mm -hmm. it doesn't matter if I fall flat on my face. My next 10 fights, I'm going to pick myself up and you're still going to see the blueprint for how a man continues to operate through the series of vicissitudes and the ups and the downs of what we call life. Mine is just in a cage, right? Mm -hmm. And then I forgot how good I was. You know, you have that first loss. You're like, well, I just, I'm just not good anymore, right? And you're like, no, dude, I was just as fast, just as strong, just as powerful. When I walked into that cage is when I walked out of that cage, it was just my perception in my mind, mm -hmm. you know? And then you kind of fall into that comfort jail cell of, of, of self-pity and you start mm -hmm. pointing the fingers, you know, all these different mistakes that I needed to make that really were immature. And I'm glad we all have to go through those immature moments. We all have those immature moments, but they make you into the mature man that you are today, you know? And even thinking about, you know, the old story about, the man pushing the rock, right? God comes to him in a vision, says he's pushed the rock right by the hill and he's pushing the rock and he's pushing the rock and he can't, he can't move it. He can't budge it. Maybe it moves an inch and it comes back two inches, right? His shoulders are jacked up. His hands are bleeding. And then finally he's just like, God, why would you, why would you send me on this journey if you knew I wasn't going to be able to push this rock up the hill? And he's like, dude, I didn't tell you to push the rock up the hill. I just told you to push the rock, just push the rock. And so it's the obedience in moving forward. And like you said, that visual of thinking about the hardest, some of the hardest times in your life is when you are winning, right? Because you're always pushing and you're always forgetting about what people are saying and continuing to move forward. It doesn't always feel good. Yeah. But that's why people follow you and watch you. And we don't follow you because of the, the virtual certainty of your success, but because of your failures. That's yeah. what we love as human beings. Yeah. Because well, we can all relate. Yeah. Right. We, we fail eight times out of 10, nine times out of 10, that's the reality of pursuing anything worthy. Do you ever stop and think how fortunate you are to have had those lessons at such a young age in life? Because a lot of people, they don't, they spend their whole lives and they never learn what you're talking about. And because of the circumstances of your life, you were able to learn these lessons as a young man, not as an old man. You yeah. ever think about that? No, I do because especially in a, a sport like mixed martial arts, that obviously I, I am so truly blessed to be in the sport, man. It's it's made me who I am. It's made me a beautiful life, a beautiful fortune, a beautiful living, and, and the the platform that I have. Everything goes back to mixed martial arts. Um, and I've seen so many guys who maybe had more talent than me, or maybe had were even bigger than me at one point. And I've continued to gain ground and continue to pass them up and continue to grow bigger. And 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 it's just. But it was only because of the lessons that I had to go go through, you know, and and doing it with as much humility as I possibly could and 
and it really does have so much to do with how I was raised, right? Mm -hmm. My mom and dad went through things their entire life. They went, they were working two and three jobs nonstop. My dad was up every single morning, putting his carpenter work boots on every single day at five in the morning and watching the way that they operated, watching the way that they lived their lives, watching the way that they always just tried their best and tried to be a better person today than they were yesterday. Um, it, it kept, it's kept me so grounded and I'm so fortunate to have that. And there was times where I would look back and, and be mad at the way that I was raised or the way that I, things that happened to my, in my young man brain oh, as man. I was growing and, but it's all kept me so, it's kept my perspective so crystal clear and knowing that I was created for great things, but I ain't, any, I ain't greater than anybody else, you know? Yeah. And it's, and it's such a beautiful thing. And, and I really do feel for people who, who have somehow fallen victim to the entitlements and the oh holier than thou and the bigger than thou and I deserve this and I deserve that when I'm like man I don't deserve anything man mm -hmm. I know I work hard enough to deserve it more than this guy but I'm going to work harder than him in order to force my deservedness and continue to force more and more accomplishment through the deservedness through the work that I do mm -hmm. Um, there's nobody so, yeah. working harder than you, bro. No, I, like, I try not, try I, not I to. Know, I know you, you, you may not say that, but it's the truth. There's nobody working harder than you. Yeah. And, and, I, and I, I, my biggest thing is taking pride in the small, the small little yeah. hard work, the things that nobody ever sees, the little disciplines where it's just me and my supplements, or it's just me and my shopping cart and mm -hmm. at the grocery store, or it's just me and that piece of litter right there, or it's me and this little decision I can make to be like, okay, this is how 90% of people would do it, but I'm going to go ahead and go the extra mile and to do this right now because we act as though our these little acts and these little thoughts that they happen in a vacuum and they happen in private. And maybe they do happen in private and people people uh they don't see them but they do eventually manifest themselves into your circumstances mm -hmm. right so i've just that's the way i was raised and that's the way i operate and it doesn't matter it didn't matter here's one thing too you know being trusted in the small things if you can be trusted in the small things then and only then can you be trusted in the big things mm -hmm. right so this training camp that i'm about to put put on starting today and moving forward to fight the biggest combat sports superstar on the planet will be no more disciplined, no more hard, no more extra than when I was fighting Kyle Swadley, my mm -hmm. first fight ever, or fighting David Rickles, a guy who maybe you guys have never heard about, or or Derek Campos, one of these guys. I I was training and the, doing the small things right, whether I was fighting the number 150 guy in the world or I'm fighting the biggest name on the entire planet mm -hmm. in the history of mixed martial arts. So if I could be trusted with those small things, that's how you end up in, in this spot, you know? And it even feels uncomfortable to say because it's not really me. It's just... It's I'm the things product, you're doing. It's a product. Of, I'm a product of my environment yeah. and, and how I was raised. And, well, if and you're the watching... It, it, it yeah, is exactly. you. It is you because it's a choice... Yeah. that we all get to make. We all get to sure. make a choice about how disciplined we're going to be. And we all get to make a choice about how serious we're going to take our lives. And we don't always start at the same spot, but we do have a choice with what we make of that. Mm -hmm. And when I look at you, I look at a regular guy who comes from what I know very well, just a very regular place. You know, St. Louis <laughs> is St. Louis. I love it. Everybody here loves it. But you know, it's a, it's a different place, man. It's very blue collar. It's very hardworking. It's not LA. It's not Miami. And I'm mm -hmm. thankful for that. People are often like, why do you still live there? I'm like, bro, because it's not that, Yeah. yeah. you know, but you, when I look at you, dude, I see someone who represents those Midwestern values, who represents, and not just in your work ethic, in your life as a man, as a family man. And, um, when I, I, I had a, a very cool experience that I think you'll, you'll, you'll enjoy. Um, this weekend, I, had, I, was, I was working out in the gym, and this guy comes walking into the gym holding a football. And I'm like, I can't see him all the way across the gym. I'm like, who is that? Why has he got a football? And he's walking right towards me. And he gets closer. I'm like, who is that? Who, who's here? And then he gets like from me to you away, and I'm like, holy shit, dude. That's Jerry Rice. That's Jerry Rice. And he's got a football in his hand. What's, what's that football for? And he hands it to me. I'm working out. He hands it to me. And, he, and it says, to Andy, hold the standard. And like this, a little message and sign Jerry Rice. And he says, hey, 
I'm here with Ben Newman. Thank you so much for allowing me to come out. This place is amazing. And I'm like, and I don't get starstruck. Yeah. But dude, it's Jerry Rice. Jerry Rice. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. You don't get starstruck, but that's Jerry Rice. Yeah. Jerry Rice. Like very <laughs> like when we talk about the greatest ever at what they did. Like you you've met a lot of great people. I've met a lot of great people. People who were at the top of the game. But when you say Jerry Rice, dude, like it's undeniable he is the greatest NFL wide receiver ever in history. And he's standing in front of me. And so I'm like halfway through my workout and I'm like, all right, well, I'll skip the workout for yeah. this. Yeah. You want to so, play catch? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, so we start talking and we hit it off immediately. And I got to talk to him for about two hours, just me and him, because they were running an event. So I went in the locker room and I got to sit down and we had a conversation. And dude, this guy... He, dude, you remind me a ton of him. Like, exactly the same kind of thing. Normal guy, comes from normal place, has figured out the very same thing that you're talking about. It's about the discipline execution on a day-by-day basis. It's not some big play. It's not get lucky. It's not talent. It's win the day. And when you win the day, you win tomorrow. And when you win tomorrow, you win the next day. And, dude, it was so cool hearing him tell me this because I thought, you know, yes, you can win the day and you can become very good. But when you see someone who ran a four, seven forty in the NFL, cause let's be real, that's not fast for a wide receiver. Yeah. There's guys that run four sevens on every single high school team in this state. Yeah. Okay. Who became the greatest receiver ever. And you hear him talk about, how hard he worked and what he did on a daily basis and how he became who he was. It just inspired me so much because I thought, yes, you could become very successful winning the day. But in reality, like when I look at you and I look at him and I look at guys like that, there's actually no upper ceiling when it comes to that. It's not talent. It's not skill. It really is. How long Do you want to execute and how, at what level do you want to execute? And dude, it was one of the coolest conversations I've ever had. And, and bro, you remind me a lot of them. Well, it's it's really cool too, because I mean, I I feel, uh, you know, sometimes things have to get, I don't know, worse before they get better. Right. Or you have to, you have to kind of go with the sensational route. I mean, I feel like we, we become very sensationalized as, as a society. Right. And Mm -hmm. we see, we see all of these crazy successes and, and of course, yeah, there, there's, there's lightning striking in a bottle or whatever you call it, or yeah, it does flash happen. in the pans. Yeah. There's these things that happen, dude. But as a whole, the people that are at the top, the people that get to, to those lofty places, it really is just normal everyday people doing normal everyday things as fat or as, as disciplined as possible and, and not being afraid to take the long road, to yeah. take the hard road yeah. brick by boring brick we do it every single day and then eventually you look around you're like i did something how did i get here yeah right i mean and and you knew you were on your way right Mm -hmm. but it was enjoying the journey and 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 enjoying and taking pride in the small things right because once again he who can be trusted with the small things then you can be trusted in the big things right when he ends up in the hall of fame he wanted to get there but you're not going to get to the hall of fame unless you can be trusted in the small things Mm -hmm. whether whether you believe in god the universe serendipity whatever it is it's going to work out like that. It's the small, it's how do you eat an elephant? You eat a big old elephant, one tiny little bite at a time, you know, but taking pride in every single one of those little bitty bites, every single one of those boring bricks. Doing it perfect. You're laying and yeah. doing it perfectly. Yeah, that's what Nick Saban talks about. You know, he talks about, we're not going to run the play until we get it right. We're going to run the play until we can't get it wrong. Mm-hmm. And that's what it comes down to. And I think what's important to po- point out about what we're talking about is that most people who have big dreams, who have big goals, who have aspirations, and you young guys who listen, you need to really listen to this, okay? You guys have to understand, you may not be LeBron James. You may not run a 4-2-40. You might not have this exceptional talent. But what Michael's done and what guys like Jerry Rice have done is they've taken very average upbringings and skill sets I mean, you were 103. Is that fair to say? 103 pounds, yeah. I mean, is it fair to say average, right? Yeah, yeah very, okay. very average. Well, most people would deem average. Yes, yeah. most people, Normal circumstances. like everybody out here starts at a place like that. 
And they say because they're not that gifted guy on the wrestling team or they're not that gifted guy on the football field or they're not that gifted guy with business who happened to start something and in two years he was worth, you know, $50 million or whatever, right? Or $10 million or a million, right? These, we, we tend to like sell ourselves short and we say, well, well, dude, I don't have that. I don't have those parents that lended me the money to start my business. I didn't, and I didn't, I wasn't born with four five forty speed you know i don't have good genetics we tell ourselves all these stories and we fail to realize that there is a way and the way is what we're talking about with michael and jerry rice these guys and by the way that's been true for me too i don't have special talent i don't have special skill set but what i do have is i have grit and fortitude and i'm willing to get up every day and do everything i can do to get there yes and i appreciate the sentiment that you have thrown my direction right now but let me let me just talk about you for a second now for for those guys listen listening i'm here at the hq when it I, I was I was gonna ask you if you even have a cleaning crew here, but I did see someone come around. I saw no less than ten people wash their hands, and then they're cleaning down and wiping down mm -hmm. the countertops mm -hmm. in the in the uh, in the gym. Every single weight is lined up perfectly. Every single dumbbell is is lined up perfectly. The place is spick and span, and it's a it's a we mentality. And mm -hmm. you leading from the front. I mean, you don't even, you don't even have to. I don't even have to know you. To walk into your establishment to see your team and see the way that these people operate and it is the physical manifestation of the way that you do one thing is the way that you do everything and it is the little things mm -hmm. right first form is not going to become the one of the biggest companies on the world because your weights are perfectly right. sat right it's right. really not it's, right maybe it does maybe it doesn't matter at all but it's just it's a it's a standard that is set right and that and that's what people can really see i mean i wish people could see and 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 really see it because it, it is inspiring and this this place is a it, it's it's people here but it just the building itself if i was walking into this building it's itself just the bricks and the mortars and the pieces of equipment and the walls and that kind of stuff this is perfection per personified right it's you, it's bro. absolutely but it's a standard that you that you set and mm -hmm. you're leading from the front mm -hmm. too right it's mm -hmm. not hey you guys all do this, but really, whenever you put the weights, you got your butler behind you putting them all. Yeah, no, you know, setting them yeah. all right. You know, it's, yeah, it only works if you live it. Yeah, man, yeah. and it's but it's it's those little bitty things done with enthusiasm and done yeah. done as if it's not even a question. There yeah. is no question. It's going to get done, and it's and it's going to be done. Well, we're very blessed to have you know because of how authentic and open I am about my feelings about the world and my <laughs> standards on the podcast. We are very blessed to have high drive, high standard individuals want to come to work here. Very rarely do we get someone that's not like that, you know? And yeah. and uh, I'll tell you a little secret about that, that a lot of you guys, you know, we have a big entrepreneurship listenership here on the show. If you want your team to do that, you all, you, I get this, this is probably my most asked question. How do you get your team to do that stuff? What do you do? Do you find them? No, dude. Look, it's very simple. And I think you'll agree with this. You already said it. Those little things that we do, they add up into the big things, how we do the big things. Mm -hmm. So when you're a leader and you're trying to get your team to execute at a high level, what you have, it's not, hey, do this. It's, this is how it is. Hey, man, look, when we straighten those weights, you're making an investment in your discipline and your attention to detail and your ability to recognize something that needs to be fixed and fixing it. And every time you do that, you're making a deposit into your own skill set, which will translate into how you execute in your career, and in your life. And here, your goal is to make money and build a career. So if you can build that skill set better, you're going to do better as a career. And, and so when we teach our team that, you know, they're already exceptional human beings. They're already high drive. They're hungry to get better. They they buy into that immediately because they're like, yeah, dude, I'm looking to get better. Yeah. Like you said, it's not the actual weight itself. Yeah. It's active the weight, but it's what it does to That's your right. deservedness. So one little, that one little penny in the bank. Yeah. Right? The deservedness to be like we were all created with greatness inside of us, but yes. not everyone deserves to get to that if they don't make the requisite sacrifices yeah. or have the requisite discipline, right? Even, and, and, and obviously my, my life is, has been fitness and, and, and fighting and wrestling and all these different things and every and business single, now and now business. Yeah. yeah. But every single little practice, I mean, you don't see the results, you know, I'm putting 
dollars in the bank, in the discipline bank today that I won't see until June 29th, mm -hmm, right? Mm -hmm. I'll start to get a little bit more shredded or start to get a little bit more fast or start to get a little bit more X, Y, and Z, but it's, it's doing things today and maybe not seeing results for two months, but that is exactly what you're talking about too. Mm -hmm. These little things that add up to the thing, when you stand at your greatest moment of opportunity or your darkest hour, you have to be able to ask, answer that question. Did I do enough? Am I enough? And you are enough if you've done the little things leading up to it. And that's the thing, dude. The path does not get easier. No. So we have to build ourselves into these people that can endure the path. Because you just said, that hour of darkness, that's coming for all of us. And it looks different in different ways. And by the way, it doesn't just come for us once. It comes over and over and over again. It comes in the form of losing a job or it comes in the form of getting a divorce or it comes in the form of getting an illness or a death in the family. And there's all these things that come at us for our whole lives. And if we don't build ourselves into someone of determination, grit, resilience, discipline, we're in a situation where we can't handle these things. Mm -hmm. and, and, and dude, our families, our friends, our significant others, they look up to us for these things. And if we're not there to handle it, that's a life failure. That is a life failure failure and people don't realize how much these little things actually create the the character skill set because i call it a skill set right because we're developing it it's not a trait people aren't naturally highly disciplined i mean maybe some people are but really it's something that we build and we can all build it and you mentioned the litter thing right that's a big deal for me like i will walk freaking half a mile out of my way if i see a bag going because i'm like dude i can't let it go yeah i can't let it go i'll remember that yeah. you know and when we little things like that people just don't think about and then you think about if everybody did think about those things how much different would the world be how much different would the world look if everybody said hey i cannot let that go i've got to fix that you know what I mean? Yeah. And, and, and dude, we live in a completely different society uh, in general, society of excellence, high standards, treating people with respect. That's one of the things I love about you most, bro, is as good of a fighter as you are, you're a better dude. You're a better man and a better husband and a better father. And it's very, very admirable, dude. Thank and um, I really appreciate the standard that you set as a man, uh, not just as a fighter. It's it's. It's really special, bro. Thank you. Yeah, I know. I just, uh, it was actually funny because I was just with, with my wife, you know, and we've kind of been having these conversations because you you also, well, one thing, going back to what you just said too, you, you can be a absolute optimist and love life and full of joy and all those things and still admit that you're going to suffer hardship. You're going to get kicked in the mouth. There's going to be bad things that happen. You're going to get things that you don't deserve to happen to you, but they're going to happen. So you have to be built up and ready for those things. And, and even right now, having the foresight to realize what's about to happen in my life. Right. And it, and it's, and it's what I asked for this. I prayed for this moment. I asked for this moment and even talked to my mom or my, my wife this past weekend. It was just like, you know, pray for, continue to pray for humility, pray for wisdom, man, because the enemy is going to attack and this is going to be big. And this is going to be an out of body experience in this, in my eye, my, the temptation for my eye to be taken off of the ball is going to be so immense. Right. So you, you have to know, that you got a big battle ahead of you and you got some things that are going to happen to you, but you can still be optimistic and know that you're the man for the job. Know that you have earned it. Know that you're right where you're supposed to be because the next season for me is going to be, you know, it's going to be, I can't even really put into words what, what's going to happen. I can't, all I can do is ask for wisdom and know and know and hope and pray that I'm able to operate Right. And that's what you got to do every single day because life is going to continue to get thrown at you. Wait, let me ask you this. What? So, you know, you mentioned your mom, your dad, your, your upbringing. What, what was the support like when you decided to get into fighting? What, what, where it was it was, was uh, mom like no my baby like I mean, did you have any of that? No, my mom's my mom's pretty rough around the edges, man. Like yeah. she's a she's a sweetheart, sweet little Betty, she's a little little bitty Italian lady. <laughs> um, and she's she's an amazing soul, but she's a little rough around the edges, right? When it comes to, like, she loved wrestling, man. Like, she was getting in oh, that's awesome. arguments and fights in the stands. Like, you know, the wrestling yeah. wrestling community is like, bro, that's Midwest moms, yeah, bro. Yeah, exactly, Midwest yeah. Mom. yeah. You know, it. and so, but it, you know, but obviously for me too, I had my my big brothers, right, Tyron and Ben, who we looked up to, and my mom idolized them as well. She's like, well, 
Tyron and Ben think you'll be all right, so I think you'll be good. I mean, and it wasn't the way that I wrestled anyway. It wasn't real slick and and fast and whatever. It was just it was basically a fight every single time I stepped on the wrestling mat. Anyway, mm-hmm. you know, except I wasn't allowed to punch legally or kick and that kind of stuff. It was aggressive, but it was aggressive, yeah. man, because it really was. You know, hey, because I started wrestling as a freshman in high school. Mm-hmm. Like I I didn't really have. I wrestled a couple years when I was younger, like but like five years old when you're mm-hmm. basically running around the mats and mm-hmm. just playing games, playing tag. And then I started really taking it serious and dedicated my life to the sport when I was 14 years old, and I've been doing hand-to-hand combat since. So I wasn't going to be able to out-slick you, out-technique you, out-wrestle you, but I could freaking out-fight you. Mm-hmm. I could out-cardio you. I could push you off the mat, run back to the center, and headbutt you and and, and, and get my hands <laughs> make on it very you. uncomfortable and make it re- listen <laughs> yeah. you might beat me yeah. you might be better than me but you don't you don't want to wrestle me again yeah. and that was yeah. kind of the mentality i had and then as i got more and more skilled i've been able to dial that back a little bit you see it a lot in my fight style you know it's kind yeah. of it's kind of the way i bro you fucking bulldog since man I was 14 yeah That's so wild. dude i told you that that uh remember after the poirier fight remember me texting you and I yeah, said, you say? I said, bro, that was, even though you lost, I said that was the greatest fucking fight I'd ever seen in my life. And it was because of how tough you fought that fight, bro. Yeah. Like, that was, I don't know how you feel about that. No, I do. No, yeah. it's, it's one of those, that was a loss. Yeah. That was a win. Yeah. You know, like, and that's, and that's what you realize too, man. It, it, it was a loss on paper. Yeah. Absolutely. You're going to, yeah. you're going to, when but I man. retire, you're going to look at it and know that was a loss on his record. But dude, I won. Dude. Right. Look at the fight I have now. Every yeah. single time I've lost, it's been another win. It's another, mm-hmm. it feels like a demotion, but it's a promotion. If, if you've done the right things, you get rewarded. Yeah. yeah. Fuck, dude. Does anything change? Cause you're, cause you typically, you fight at lightweight, right? But mm-hmm. this is a welterweight fight. Yeah. So, so that's 170. I think no, yeah. nothing's really going to change except I'll be, able to, I'll be able to eat a little bit more and, yeah. and eat a little bit more carbs. This this you know a lot of people. I they, fucking love carbs. Yeah, yeah. Well, they they bring up <laughs> they bring up Michael Phelps, right? Because everyone's heard the stories like, dude, are you just pounding the calories with how much you're training? And you'd be flabbergasted to know, like, I'm usually eating between like 1,200 and 1,500 calories per day, and training oh, twice a day five days a week or five days a week once on saturday and then two of those th- two of those five days in between i'm hitting a third cardio session a third workout on 1200 to 1500 calories a day shrinking my body down losing a little bit of muscle getting rid of all the fat and then dehydrating myself at the end but so for 170 you know i'm like 185 ish right now because i've already been training for the last four weeks um so i'll probably eat enough to keep myself get like shred down a little bit lose a little bit of body fat get myself right where i need to be which is going to be like that 177 mark and then just a nice little easy water cut at the end it's going to be the best camp of my life man Mm -hmm. i can't wait to fight 170 that's awesome do you what's the difference between your what's your normal fight weight 155 okay do you unfortunately do you think that there's a a difference in the the cardio aspect at those two weights um like fighting at 155 versus fighting at 170 yeah in, like in general, the two weight classes. Yeah, I think there's. I mean, there's a generally. Well, the, I don't listen, man. I don't know a ton about MMA. I, I'm no. I'm a fan, but I'm a casual fan. Yeah, but general generally, the lo- lower the the more you get up in weight class, the high, mm-hmm. the lower the pace, right? Mm-hmm. The slower the pace. So yeah, 155. There's there's better cardio than than at 170. Mm-hmm. You know, but for me, I feel like I'm I'm gonna be just weighing in at 170 instead of dehydrating myself to 155. And I'm, and once again, I'm gonna do the exact same training camp. Just eat a little bit more, yeah. maybe. Thank God, yeah. you know. Yeah. Take eat, drink a couple more protein shakes. What kind know? of diet do you follow, man? So since I have to get, I basically have to shrink my body down. I'm eating basically no carbs, like starchy carbs at all. I'm basically doing protein and veggies, two two meals a day with a snack in between, um, and a protein shake once mm-hmm. a day mainly. Mm-hmm. Um, so it's really just meat and veggies for to lo- low carbs, eight, eight weeks. So just this thin. time I'll be able to have a, yeah, this, this way, this time I'll have a, a little bit of sweet potato Yeah, daily. Yeah. Thank God. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, dude, listen, man, I, I, I think it's really cool to hear you talk about, you know, the work ethic aspect, you know, out of all the guys that you fought and trained with. Who who do you respect the most for their work ethic? Who's a, um, who's a guy that like you look at and you're like, damn dude, he gets it. I think Eddie Alvarez. Yeah. Um, and I say that too because I have inside scoop because I now I train with I train with my coaches, you know Henry Hooft, who was who was Eddie's coach I think for like four or five years. He Henry, who is my my head coach right now, cornered against me whenever I, when he coached Eddie 
against me when I lost my my in, first in fight the rematch. Yeah, yeah. So it's you know it's kind of funny how it all com- came full circle, but it's numerous times he's been like, you know, you remind me of Eddie because because I'm always like 30 minutes early to practice. I'll already be rolling out by the time uh coach comes in or other guys are coming in because i want to get there a little bit early i want to i want to be stretched i want to be warmed up i want to be ready because when it's time to go i don't want to take me 30 minutes to get my get the juices you want to get good work in yeah i want to get the good work in right i already want to be ready he's like you know he's always said that and i'm like yeah and the funny thing between me and eddie is like dude you cannot try to kill somebody for 25 well almost 50 minutes he and i had two of the best fights in mma history um you cannot do that with somebody for that many minutes inside of a cage and not have a ton of respect for each mm-hmm. other. So we have a ton of respect for each other. Um, those were fun fights. And it's always good when you know a guy lives that life too, right? Mm-hmm. You know, he's he he lives the champion lifestyle. He does things right. He's a good dude. He's a family man. It's it's the kind of guys that you're like, dude, this is you you deserve it. I deserve it. I believe I deserve it a little bit more. I want to beat you, but dude, this is about to be a good one, you know? Yeah. That's awesome, man. Yeah, dude, I, I was over here thinking too, man, because when you had mentioned even like you know that you went three fights, losses back to back, it was like how many days you said it was like six hundred, six hundred eighty eight. To go that long, you know, work all that time for this big climax of an event to have that, even just that, and then to deal with that one time, how did you bounce back off of that? Well, so there there is a little bit of a lesson in there and there's and and it was it was the way that I was conditioned right because the sport of wrestling the great the greatest thing about it is you're going to get 30 or 40 opportunities to to wrestle per year right yeah. if i lost a, a tough match on wednesday i'm down on myself wednesday night i get back to practice thursday saturday i get the opportunity to right that wrong to go from the a lo- the loss column to yeah. the win column yeah. very quick you get another opportunity but in mixed martial arts it's like dude I mean, I haven't fought since November 2022, and most of the time we're fighting. When you get to the upper echelon and the the higher levels, you're fighting twice a year, maybe three times a year, but probably usually twice a year. So you got to sit on that loss for five months, six months, right? So the biggest thing for me was is getting back. And the, and the mistake that I made was right away. I wanted to hide from it. I kind of, I I didn't want to. You, you kind of lose that motivation to train a little bit. You're like, was it like an embarrassment? Big time embarrassment, yeah. man. You know, and it's in in, but now not anymore. No, so no, no. I'm I get glad, it. I'm yeah. glad I had to go through yeah. that to to realize it. And anybody who is listening right now, and if you have that, it really is ego, right? Yeah. People don't care that much. Yeah, we we mm-hmm. think people care more about us, so much more about us than, than we facts. do, right? Yeah. And when you re- and and almost like I said, sometimes it's it's supposed to be a part of the journey. It's supposed to be a part of your journey. It's I was supposed to lose those fights, or I was mm-hmm. supposed to have this shortcoming because. If a bad thing happens, but a good thing comes from it, was it really a bad thing? Mm-hmm. And how many times have you had that play out in your life, oh, right? Man. And you'd ask, you're like, well, a good thing come, came from it. So I that thing that I thought was a bad thing, I can't really call it a bad thing anymore because it turned into a really good thing. And God had me in the palm of his hand the entire time. And then it, it led to this and it led to that. Um, but yeah, the problem was losing the, that fight and then going in, like dealing with uncharted territory because I hadn't lost a competition since two or three years prior in wrestling. And at, and at that point it didn't really matter because I had just become an all American. I kind of got to where I wanted to go anyway. Um, so I dealt with it and not in a great way, not in a very mature way. And, uh, and then I didn't get the opportunity to right that wrong for months and months and months. It was probably six months that I had to sit out and go through a training camp, figure out who's next, who am I fighting next? Um, and, uh, yeah, it's just I I deal with losses so much better now, and so much, and maybe it's just you kind of just isn't it awesome though too? I was thinking about that today. Just the older you get, you just don't care as much anymore when it comes to like, dude. I used to care so much about what people thought, and used to care so. I'm like, I'm so solidly standing on my own two feet now, and and I, and the fifty. If you thought fifteen year old Michael saw the thirty eight year old Michael. He would be like, ah, how did you get there, dude? Because I yeah. don't see how we get from here to there. Because we are, we're on like another planet, you mm-hmm. know. But it was just the constant, every single day, great things in my life, and some of the tough things getting kicked right in the teeth. And and this sport wants to keep you down as long as it, as long as you will let it. And it's up to you to pick yourself back up. And I've been able to do it now for 16, that, 17 years. That's the key, dude. You know, a lot of people they will they will get in those dark times, and and they don't understand that that time is meant to build a new skill set, to give you a new perspective, 
And the only way that you can discover that is by continuing down the path. There's so many people that have the hardship happen and then they stop, right? They get embarrassed. They get, they get, cause dude, I'm going to tell you this, as much as you guys think it's embarrassing to start and be bad at something, it's a million times more embarrassing to be great at something and have everybody in the world see you fucking fall on your face. That's way worse. Yeah. And it is ego. And, and I do agree with you. As you get older, you start to realize it's not as big of a deal. But I also think that that comes from us firmly understanding the work that needs to be done to get past that, right? Um, I think when you're, when I, at least when I was younger and I felt, I felt setbacks, I didn't have enough confidence in the work, the work that needed to be done to understand that I could pull myself out of it. And, and ignorantly, but also thankfully, I just got up the next day and kept going, dude. Like I didn't know what else to do. So I would get up and I would go and, you know, think, dude, I can't, I mean, most of my business life, I live within weeks of being out of business. People don't think that about entrepreneurs, dude. Like you're, you're living on the edge all the time, yeah. you know, until you get to a, you know, where we're at now, it's not like that anymore. But, you know, most of your life as an entrepreneur, the first 10, 10 plus years, it's, it's scary and you're going to take hits. And sometimes those hits are nearly ending of your journey. But like when you don't know what else to do, you wake up the next day and you just keep doing what you've been doing. Um, and because people don't do that and they get embarrassed and they, they get humiliated in their own mind. Um, I can relate to that, bro. I can relate to the hiding and the, and the shame and the, the embarrassment and the feeling of letting people down and uh, if you guys just push through those times and you continue down the path, what you'll figure out is what Michael's talking about, which is, dude, this is here to serve you. This is here to build you. This is here to give you a new perspective and a new skill set, which will eventually lead to a place like you were saying, where you're standing on your own two feet and you have total real confidence in yourself, not fake confidence, not bravado, beating my chest, not running my mouth, but knowing that if something negative comes around or I, I get a setback that it's not a total devastating loss. It's exactly that. It's a bump in the road. It's a setback. Yeah. What, I mean, and what I did, what I started doing too, <clears throat> and I forced myself to do this, you know, when I take a loss, I'm making sure I get on as big of a platform as I possibly can ASAP and talk about it. Right. Yeah. Because right. Ego would say, well, let's just hide because if you get on the microphone, all those people who doubted you and they're going to point the fingers. Now you're on a microphone. You're talking about this loss. You're reliving this loss mm -hmm. in real time on a mm -hmm. microphone. And I, I have forced myself to do that. You know, busting with the boys. I don't know if you know mm -hmm. those guys. Yeah. Yeah. Dude, Will Compton is my first guy. Oh, that's, yeah, that's right. I, yeah. He's St. He's Louis. St. Louis guy. Yeah. That's right. So yeah. So those guys are in Nashville yeah. too. So I like to make it a habit. Dude, Will's win, hilarious. Yeah. Win, lose or draw, man. I'm going, I'm going to try to go on the bus yeah. on Monday and I've done it with black eyes and still stitches. And yeah, my nose, you know, my nose is all jacked up from the, the fight bef the 48 hours prior because I want to do that because and it's not for the Will and Taylor. It's not yeah. for you. It's not. And I honestly love my fans and supporters, but it's not for anybody. It's for me. Yeah. So I can get on there and I can sit right here and say, yeah, you know what? Look at me. Look at my scars. But this mm -hmm. reminds you that I'm still here. Mm -hmm. Look at the black eyes. Look what I've gone through. And if I can get on here and talk right now after I just had. The whole world laughing at me in my mind and I can brave that and hop on this microphone, you know, it, it wells something up inside of you. And then once you've done it a couple of times, you're like, man, I, I got so much positive feedback from that because people want to see that they mm -hmm. don't, cause they don't expect, they expect you to not kind go of into hiding, off. not yeah. going to hiding necessarily, but Hey, let's let them take some time off. It's like, yeah. no, I'm, I'm doing this for me and I want to get on here and I'm going to, it's kind of like writing the wrong that we just talked about. Yeah. It's like, I'm writing the wrong. I'm taking the power away from it mm -hmm. until you talk about That's it, right. until you, until you wear it like a badge of honor, you own it. You're yeah. You're giving it all the power until yeah. you take that power back and say, here it is. It's yeah. right here. You want to talk about and it? It's okay. Me? And it's okay. Yeah. Because this is what, this is what, what, what it is this is what it is and this is how it's supposed to happen and those those areas of us right will be broken the 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 weakest areas of us where we need to get better where we're falling short where we've got some ego where we've got all these shortcomings those little areas will break and then scar tissue will be laid over top of it and then you will be stronger in those areas where we were weak and that's it's it's life it's like it's life revealing to you where you need to get better Let's talk about the technical aspect of improving from your losses. Yeah. Do you watch film? 
I yeah. was just about to ask that. Like for I, I, film study, yeah. yeah. Yeah, I mean, I don't watch a ton of film. I, I obviously got to go back and watch my fights back. Yeah. Um, win, lose, or draw. Obviously, I love to watch the wins better than I love to watch <laughs> the losses. But that's another part of the healing process, too. It's like, hey, sit down here right now and watch it. You know, Don't watch it too many times. You don't yeah. want to sit there and have a negative mental highlight reel in my head. No, but just wanna, to learn. Yeah. Okay, I could have done this better. Yeah. I Is that what you do? Yeah, and even just watching... You know, watching yourself, whether it be technical, whether it be spiritual, because you can see those moments where you had a momentary lapse of judgment or where you lost a little bit of focus or maybe you got a little bit tired or maybe you made a silly decision. You see that on the film? Yeah, and you can kind of see it because 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 you start to have flashbacks a little bit, and mm -hmm. it's not necessarily because it's a fight and you're getting punched in the head that you don't really remember a lot of stuff. You're just you're really in that kind of fight or flight mode. You're tied onto a tornado, so you're you don't remember a ton of it. So you need to go back, and then as you're watching it, you're kind of starting to feel and see mental glimpses in, of what you remember in your mind, and uh, yeah, just going back and, and seeing different areas. Um, and then it, it's also a place of gratitude. Win, lose, or draw, you just go back, and then then you can hear the announcers talking. The you know you hear John Anik and Joe Rogan, Daniel Cormier, whoever it might be, and you're watching it, and you're just like, man, I'm watching this movie happen, and I'm the main character. Whether I win or lose, it's another it's another cool way to to, to remind yourself, man, you're doing what you were called to do. Mm -hmm. Win, lose, or draw, you're not defined by your wins and losses. You're defined about by how, how you carry yourself, and uh, yeah, take some notes. Talk to the coaches, take a little bit of time off, stay in shape and stay built up and start kind of the, the recovery process of the mind and the heart after a loss, especially, and continuing to be out in the public and, and not be afraid to wear it like a badge of honor. Let me ask you this, because you obviously <clears throat> did. I mean, the people love you, right? Like you have a shit ton of support. The people absolutely love you. The NFL has armchair quarterbacks. What, what's the UFC guy? What do you, what do you guys oh, call man. it? Yeah, no. Now, how I do mean, you address those 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 people? You know yeah, what I'm talking about. Yeah, no, for sure. Um, I see red, bro. <laughs> <laughs> I, don't know. I was in that ring. I would have yeah, I don't know. All he had to do was hit him with the overhand right. Yeah. You know? Hold my beer. I'll show you what I yeah, would Yeah, exactly. No, I mean, oh, we got a lot of them, man. And Does you know, you guys what? have a special name for. Them? No, I don't really think so. I'm sure. I'm sure the ch you know the, the chat might have them you know, later on, like what, what they call them. But yeah, dude. I mean. I actually just was talking to some guy today, um, and I sent him a message and just said, "Hey, uh, I hate to hear about I hate to hear about the passing of your uh, of your thread of videos that you that you made like ten videos talking about how I'm an idiot and I'm waiting for Connor and it's never <laughs> Connor's never going to come back and fight me and blah, blah, blah. fight's never going to get booked and all this kind of stuff." So we kind of had a little banter back and forth, and it's all fun and games because I heard it from a million people. Um, but yeah, I mean, you hear those people, and it is just really funny. And 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 some of the sometimes you agree with them. You're like, yeah, dude. Shit, if man. you go back and watch this in slow motion, you reverse it and watch it five times. You're like, yeah, that was a dumb decision. Why did I do that? Or why didn't I do that? Yeah. But what they don't realize is they are they are criticizing and critiquing something that was happening in real time, making split second decisions with the information that you have, part muscle memory, part instinct, part training. And you just hope that you zig when you should have zagged or, or, or vice versa or whatever. And you're just in there, you're in there responding and reacting. Mm. So it is, uh, it is really funny because yeah, I mean, it, especially mixed martial arts, right? Cause there's so many dudes who talk trash who would never in a million years say anything to me, to my face or, and that's what I've realized moving over to the UFC. I mean, I went from Bellator, I was, I was the biggest name in Bellator had the largest social media following in Bellator, kind of the, the, the biggest name there. And everybody saw the writing on the wall that I was going to test free agency. The day that I signed with the UFC, I got like 600,000 followers in like 24 hours, right? right? On just on Instagram. And that's not in, that doesn't mean I'm any cooler than anybody else, but it was just that's how, pretty cool. It, it was pretty cool. Uh, but yeah. pretty but cool. Like yeah. How quickly, how quickly <laughs> it happened. Right. And then I was like, Oh shoot, man. Most of the time, people were just talking to me because they liked me. Now it's like people just want to talk to me because they want to hate on me. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and it went to a way different level, which was so good for me because I needed it. I really am. I got into this sport wanting everybody to love me. And I'm like, man, if I just do the right things and I fight hard and I entertain them and I, and I say what I believe and I do it, people are going to love me, man. Not everyone's going to love me. Nobody's going to dislike me. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> you know, you know, it's like, you know, so I had to get over that and it was really good. It was a very immature thing. I mean, you, you know, like, yeah. and, and, and even hearing you speak and the way that you operate and, and, and it, you've unlocked things in me because it really is a blessing to be in a, in a position where people are hating on you. Cause it means you're doing something right. Yeah. But I was, I wasn't ready for it. 
Um, and now with the whole Connor thing, now it's about to go to the moon. So I'm going to have to continue to add layers to my skin over yeah, these yeah. next yeah, dude, the, if, days. When you're authentic, when you are an authentic human being, you are going to have, people are going to hate you, dude. Like yeah. it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter what, it doesn't matter Simply if you just for that, bro. If yeah. you, exactly. Yeah. They're going to hate the way that you show up, that you shine, bro. You don't ha it's not even about being successful. It's just about being authentic. People do not like people with authentic opinions. They are very used to seeing people pander. They are very used to seeing people go with the flow or tiptoe around. And when you show up like we do every day and we're like this is what I think mm -hmm. regardless of what you think, people don't like that. You know what I'm saying? And mm -hmm. and and it doesn't matter if you are curing cancer or if you're solving world hunger or you're creating world peace. People are still going to be pissed off about it, man. Yeah. And so many people hide behind trying to avoid that criticism when in reality, if you are doing something of any significance at all, the fact that people are giving you that sort of attention is a, is a really good sign. Mm -hmm. And, um, What's really cool is that, at least in my case, and I know this is your case too because I've seen it, a lot of people start off hating. They're like, God, dude, I can't stand that guy. All, he ever, does, he, all he ever does is talk shit. I can beat his ass. Yeah, yeah right. and, then, and, then, and then after six months, they're, they're like this. Man, you know what? I used to not like you, dude, but I really like you. Dude. Yeah. yeah. That is my favorite thing yeah. because because and uh, you know who's a good example of that right now is a guy named Bo Nickel. He yeah, was Bo, like, Bo, right. Bo Nickel's the first form. Oh, there yeah. you go. So yeah. Bo is exactly like Bo's me awesome. in, in a lot of ways. Yeah, right? he's he got booed. Yeah, you know he got booed at the weigh-ins or he's he got a little bit of boo in the crowd for no reason. Just the fact that that he's getting this this love from the UFC and he's getting he's getting pushed and he's being promoted and 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 there was the same thing with me. I came into the UFC. And everybody's like, who's this Bellator punk getting this and getting that? And I got a title shot on my second fight. And I'm like, guys, first of all, I didn't choose this. It wasn't like I came in and and all of a sudden I'm in charge of Dana and Dana's m making his decisions. It's like, this is how they're doing it. And don't be mad at me, right? And a year in, and I talked to Bo about this too, man, because they're going to hate on you because because they, they see it. And maybe their favorite fighter is this guy and you're getting more shine than that guy. Everybody's got their reasons why they don't like you, right? And then, but then eventually you're just like, man. And I think Bo said that in his post fight press conference or in his post fight speech, he was just like, hey, just give it time. I promise you're gonna, you're gonna like me. Like, yeah. And that's kind of what I said. I'm like, dude, there's yeah. no reason why you should dislike me. Just yeah. give it time. And my favorite, my favorite interactions are those ones where it's like, dude, I didn't like you when you came into the UFC because of this, because of that, or whatever it might have been. But dude. I've become, I've come around. I'm like, dude, yeah. me winning you over is yeah. actually so much better than me. You having, liking me from the get. Yes. Yeah. Liking me from the get go, because yeah. all you can do is just be authentically yourself. Yeah. And, I, and I think it is, it is unbecoming to so many people because, because they're living a life of, they're living a life of knowing that they're not being their authentic self. And when they see somebody operating in, in authenticity, it, it feels weird to them, you know? And I, and I, think I was somewhat like that when I was younger, right? Well, yeah, bro. You know, and then, and I've, I, as I've grown, we all know, so. try to be yeah. what we think the success part of looks like, Yeah, you know, and, and what we don't realize brother is that it looks like us. <laughs> it looks like who we are, Yeah, you know, and we live in social media where it's all marketing and it's all look at me and it's all clicks and likes and shares. And when you're an authentic person, especially when you're a person who doesn't buy into the debauchery of society, <clears throat> yeah. it makes people feel weird. You know, that makes people feel like you're being too good or you're standing on a pedestal, which, dude, I know this in your case, that is not the case at all. Yeah. And yeah. And that's the, I think that's the toughest ones for me is where people are like, ah, I don't know. There's just something about him. I don't think it's. I don't think it's authentic. I don't think that's really who he is. And I'm just yeah. like, I don't know, man. Whatever. Yeah, those know. people save everybody. Like, man. It like is they what think it is. I got some so many skeletons in my closet, yeah. and I was like, I don't know, dude. Whatever. I yeah. ain't perfect. I'll tell you that. Much. Hey, show me yours yeah. first. Sorry, if you, yeah, <laughs> sorry, if you, sorry if you don't like me, but well, I think that's where people get in trouble too, is they pretend to be perfect. Yeah. You know, they're like, oh yeah, I'm a perfect guy. I've never made any mistakes. Fuck, dude. Right. I fucked it all up. Yeah. All the shit. <laughs> yeah. well, you know what I'm saying? Well, you know what was funny for me too was going on to the Ultimate Fighter, and I had this surreal conversation with my wife. I was just like, "Hey, babe, I'm, I'm, I gotta be honest with you. I'm like really nervous 
because you know we're on ESPN and it's like it's, you're mic'd up and you know I'm something's gonna happen. I'm gonna end up mother effing Connor or saying whatever and, and like and it ended up happening. You know, it really ended up happening. And I'm like and I'm like worried about my father in law who I respect like he, like I respect him so much. My parents and my sons. My like yeah. it lives on the internet forever. My sons will hear me. You know, say the F word on ESPN and they bleeped it out to Connor when we got got in our little, you know, put pushing match. But my wife, who I like, obviously, she is my favorite human being on the planet. The one that I confide in, the one that I love the most out of anybody. And she just looked at me. She's like, hey, you're not perfect. Don't try to be perfect. If you yeah. try to be perfect, like, it's not real. You're not perfect. I, and I love you that you're not perfect. I love you through your imperfections. And if you swear or you cuss or you do this or you do that or you come off any way you come come off, it doesn't matter. I love you and everybody who really loves you loves you. And I'm like, absolutely. Dang dude, I'm about to cry. You know, she's like, yeah. And then it gave me that permission because it really is a scary thing because you don't, I don't want to come off differently than, than I want to be. Right. I just want to be myself and do it. And if something bad happens or I say something I wish I wouldn't have said, I might have to apologize or maybe I don't need to apologize. Well, bro, I, I think that the fact that, you know, how I see that, I see that from a little bit different perspective. I see that as a testament to how hard you tr you put the effort in to not be that way, yeah. right? Like if you're just how you are where you don't really curse and you're you're very composed and you have a good uh, disposition and you're polite and respectful, sometimes when that gets out of whack a little bit, it actually just is a testament to how hard someone works to keep that in check. Yeah. And so that's how I see those things. Yeah, no, I like that. I, I yeah. Because yeah. it because it definitely came out, you know. Yeah. I'm yeah. Like, I'm like, ah, whatever. But the Well, the, let's be real, dude. In a fight situation, yeah. there are no rules. Yeah, yeah, yeah. exactly. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And and the funny thing was was that my father in law was was visiting that day to Vegas whenever that whole fight thing happened and I just got done mother effing Connor or whatever. It, but it was it was funny too because now that it's happened I'm like, that was actually wasn't that bad. You yeah. know, it's like, once again, and it's weird how as a 38 years old, I'm like dealing with this and I'm still learning the uncharted territory of, of that. Yeah. Right. And you're like, and to people who are out there like, well, Michael Chandler looks like he's got all figured out. I'm like, dude, I'm trying to get this thing figured out every single day. Yeah, bro. Dude, you know? can we talk a little bit about your faith? Yeah. Yeah, I man. So yeah, dude. So, so were, was this something that you grew up with or something that you came around or so high, high Ridge, yeah. Missouri, um, on high Ridge Boulevard, there was a little Catholic church up there. Um, so we, I was raised Catholic. We did, you know, our first Holy communion and, and we did PSR, which is public school religion on Mondays. We would go there for an hour or two on Mondays, uh, first Holy communion got confirmation. And then we kind of stopped going to church for a little while, you know, three boys, baseball, getting, you know, very, very busy family. Um, and then I got invited by uh, another guy from St. Louis who was on my wrestling team to, his name's Kenny Bowen, to Twin Rivers uh, Church mm -hmm. on Lee May Ferry, Tesson Ferry, one of the two. And uh, he's like, hey, man, we got this youth group that we got on Wednesday nights. You know, we're going to go after practice. I'm like, sure, dude, I don't have a car, but if you want to pick me up, let's go. So that was the first time that I kind of started going to like a spirit-filled, non-denominational church. And then... After I started going, then my brother started going, and then my mom and dad started going. So that was kind of our first introduction to kind of a spirit-filled church, if you will. And that's where I really got saved. And I was 14, 15 years old. Um, and it was an invitation. It started with an invitation from a guy who I looked up to. He was a year older than me, Kenny Bowen. All the girls loved him. He was cute. He was handsome. He was an athlete. Like, he was the guy, right? But he was also a really, really great dude. Mm -hmm. um, so that's, that's, Isn't that that's always the best? Yeah, dude. Isn't that the best when you meet someone who's got all the skill, all yeah. the talent, got all the stuff, and you find out that they're even a better dude? Yeah, dude, that's the best. Yeah. Like it's you know, and that's the guys that I always kind of gravitated towards, and then wanted to be, um, obviously. And then, um, so yeah, I mean, that's when I really, really when I got saved, and then, you know, it's been my guiding light since then. Um, and it definitely ain't all sunshine and rainbows. And just because you got, you know, Jesus in your heart and you've accepted him, that all of a sudden things are going to work out for you. You know, your test is your or your faith is tested every single day. Mm -hmm. um, but it's been the one thing, obviously, that I've been able to look back on and be like, man, once again, looking at this whole big picture. Right. The bad things that have happened to me that that ended up being good and how God's had me in the palm of his hand the entire time, whether it be through the right person, through the wrong person through the ups, through the downs, through everything. It's just been, um, you know, and, and then now to have a platform 
where I can, you know, I don't talk a ton about my faith, but mm-hmm. it's it's my favorite. It shines through, bro. It shines through. And my two favorite kind of philosophies about faith for me, and this is how I do it, right, is live your life with so much joy and zeal and happiness that uptight Christians question your salvation. Mm-hmm. All right. That's yeah. number one. Um, and number two, preach the gospel at all times, but but only use words when necessary, mm-hmm. right? You are a living testimony. The way that you operate, the way that you live your life, the way that you love people, um, the way that you compete, the way that you just live life is your 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 testimony and your expression of your faith. You don't. I don't have to sit here and talk to you about my favorite scriptures or try to get every single person that I talk to saved because. It's not the right time for the right, or it might be the right person, but at the wrong time, and everybody's going through their different things. And if I can be a light in that way, and uh, and that's that's what feels authentic to me, and that's how I share my faith as much as possible. Bro, I'd be honest with you, <clears throat> uh, just knowing you and and observing that part of you has inspired me in that way. Just so you know, thank you, man. Yeah, it's it's really cool, and I recognize that you live it, and um, it, it's just it's. It's one of the things I admire most about you, bro, Thank because you. you're, you've been at the top of the world. You're one of the most famous guys in the world, um, in the most famous sport in the world. And you've never let that change who you are. And you've always continued to live that message and, and be a good dude. And, uh, you are that dude. You know what I'm saying? You're that guy that I'm talking about when you say so you meet this guy who's got this and this and this and this, and then you find out, dude, this guy's even a better human. And, um, it's one of the, it's my favorite thing about you, bro. Dude, thank yeah. you, man. That's cool. I appreciate man. it, man. And, yeah, and I'm that's that's uh because I do hear it a lot where people, I mean, I, I really thank you, thank you for talking about your faith. And to me, I don't really feel like I talk about it that much in mm-hmm. in, a, in a very uh, I think in a very uh, formal way, if you will, right? Because you think like what what is it what does it sound like to talk about your faith, right? Do we have to talk scripture? Do we have to say, talk about God's perspective on every single, every single thing? Do we have to, you know, do we have to operate as Jesus would? Do we, you know, how do, how do you do it? I mean, I think the biggest thing is, is if the Holy Spirit is inside of you and you try to do your best and you're just operating in that way, he doesn't have to, he doesn't necessarily want you to be talking about him all the time. He just wants you to be a shining light. To live it. Just, just, to just live it. Yeah. And that's really preaching the gospel at all times, but only using words when necessary. Only yeah. quoting scripture when necessary. I love that. Only, you know? And and people can tell. People can tell how you by how you live your life most of the time where your faith is at. And that's a lot more effective than a lot, like you said, the uptight Christians. Mm-hmm. You know, I like we, that one. Yeah, it makes huh? me feel uncomfortable. I like that one. We, yeah. Well, we like see this. We see this in society right now, right? Yeah. Because things have gotten so far out of control that people out of are morality people are finding jesus again which is mm-hmm. awesome but what we're what i'm seeing and observing is like people are going so far to where they're standing on their little pedestal and they're preaching at you trying to say this and then really when you look at them you're like well bro are you actually living that or are you just good at quoting the numbers and, and the passages and this and that? Yeah. And I personally believe and by, by no means am I an expert, but I personally believe that leading the way in that and how you live, how you treat people, how kind you are, how graceful you are. Uh, and that doesn't mean that sometimes you don't have to stand for yourself or, you know, Jesus flipped some tables over once in yeah. a while. You know what yeah. I mean? He wasn't a pacifist. Um, but I think that's far more important and far more impactful than someone who just preaches all the time. Yeah, no, one one thousand. I think I think it's damaging a lot of times. I think a lot of people are so preachy that people who are, are kind of on their way to finding it are like, oh man. We all feel it. Yeah, we all feel that whenever you're whenever you're around somebody who you're just like, dude, you you are unattainable. Mm-hmm. Like nobody wants somebody who's nobody wants to really be around. Nobody wants. Would you really want to be a Christian if it if it seems like the level at which you need to be to be a good little boy and a good little Christian? It's it's unbecoming and it, and it makes it makes me feel uncomfortable. Yeah. Right. You know, like you're, you're not good like, enough. Yeah. Like, and, yeah. and that's the that is the biggest problem. Like, right. Like, like God doesn't call the qualified. He qualifies the called. He mm-hmm. he, he is qualifying you every single day. Whether whether you are 
whether you, like you said, know every single chapter and verse, or you're absolutely perfect, or you have screwed every single thing up, but you've had a change of heart and you're trying to work your way, mm -hmm. you know, back into being a man of faith and, and walking in, in a certain direction. And a lot of times, man, it's those who have gone through the craziest things, the most embarrassing things, the most, the most painful, sinful down in the dumps, down in the valley things that God uses the most, man. Those are the people who I can look at him and say, yeah, but look where he came from mm -hmm. and look what God did with his life and look at how, look at the testimony that he has. You know, you can't have a testimony without a, without a few scars, man, mm -hmm. you know, um, because it is, it's on, it's on, uh, it's unattainable, you know? And then there's, there's people who, you know, like a, a guy like Tim Tebow, you know, he's, he's very, very, every single thing that he talks about is, is faith driven. Right. And and that's what feels authentically to him. And that's his calling, right? It feels but authentic from him, from him, yeah. and, from him. And, yeah. and he, he's got a calling on his life, man. For sure. he, and he's that guy. But, but if, if, if you were like, Hey man, I need you to be a little bit more like Tebow. I'd be like, Hey dude, it's not you. I don't know if yeah. that's my thing. Yeah. And that's, does that make him, uh, does that mean when we stand at the pearly gates, we're not both walking waltzing right in, no. you know? No, we both are, um, but my testimony is different. And, and I actually did a podcast with uh, uh, Brian Tome, who's a pastor, and we we were talking back and forth, and we were kind of talking about, you know, because I've I've spoken at churches before, I've spoken at men's conferences, I've spoken um, on you know on the at the pulpit, right? Mm -hmm. And and you'd be so surprised at how many people you would think would be like, well, dude, how how can this guy be a fighter and a Christian? It's like, well. Fighting is just the shiny object, right? Mm -hmm. We've all got the, we've all got these talents and these gifts and these shiny objects that get people to look, both the followers and the non-followers and the people who have not come to Christ yet. We've all got that shiny thing that we can say, "Hey, this is this is going to get you to look." Now peel back the layers and now let me make you feel something right now through our interaction. Mine just happens to be fighting in a cage, and it's no more it's no more better or worse than anybody else's calling on their life because you know, and this pastor said this, Brian said, he's like, man, you are reaching people that I would never in a million years be able to reach. Right. That's right. Like if you look at it just straight from a, a faith standpoint and you say, well, this guy fights in a cage and he can win this many, but this guy's a preacher and he can win this many. It's not, it's not crazy to think that I have a greater crowd of witnesses and mm -hmm. I have, I have some impact that I can make that leads maybe not that person to me to then give their life to Christ, but that person to the next rung, to the next rung. But I was one of the catalysts that started that. Right. Mm -hmm. That's the way that I look at it. And the way that I operate is, uh, just authentically to myself and speaking about it when I want to, or, or me to, or when I'm asked about it or when I feel led to, um, but that's one of the biggest things. God doesn't call the He doesn't call the qualified. He qualifies the called, and He and He will well something up inside of you. And at different times, different seasons, right? Mm -hmm. Once again, the fighter that I am today needed to go through that lost streak, or needed to go through this self doubt, and needed to go through that, needed to have this upbringing. That's the that's the faith journey in a nutshell, right? As long as it eventually leads to this one spot. You're gonna go through these different seasons, and you might, and it might be, it might be the right path. It might, and you might be the right person, but it just might not be time yet. It might mm -hmm. not be the right time. I love that. You know, man. I love it. I love it. So Where what's what's it. so so what's after fighting, man? Um, now I know this, but yeah, <laughs> but I want people to hear it and support. Yeah, you. I mean, after fighting, man, you know, so I'm, I'm involved in a couple of different companies, both through investment and then, uh, kind of leadership roles. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, I have a, a fitness app that I work on and we're building a community. I mean, obviously fitness is always going to be a, a part mm -hmm. of my life and mm -hmm. it's, and it's changed my life. It's made me a living. It's made me a platform. It's made me everything, right? If I hadn't found the sport or sport of wrestling and then it turned me into the man that I am today, um, you know, I just, I just owe a debt of gratitude to fitness and making people find the best versions of themselves. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, so continuing to work on my businesses, build that. Um, I want to speak on stages. I want to write. I want to just impact as many people as possible. Um, mm -hmm. both, you know, in front of the camera, behind the camera, on the microphone, behind the microphone, um, and just leave my mark on this planet. Um, you know, when I get done fighting and it's really great too. like hearing, you know, we have a lot of the same friends who have, who have kind of always said the same thing, man. Like you're, 
the fortune you're going to make and the impact that you're going to make and the platform that you're going to make is going to be tenfold after you lay the gloves down. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, hold on, dude. I don't know. Yeah. You know, you kind of, you kind of, it's get, gonna, you know, you kind of get into that mode where you're like, really, dude? Well, okay. Well, if you see, if you see that, man, I want to, I'm going to keep on working and I'm going to keep on talking and I'm yeah. going to keep on getting after it. And, uh, you know, I, I just see myself in a position to be able to use the the lessons that I've learned through the last 23 years of, of uh, 24 years of hand-to-hand -hand combat and its uh, its similarities to the fights that all of us are going through in mm -hmm. every single aspect of our life mm -hmm. and uh, turning it into a masterpiece that's going to be able to reach the masses. Yeah, and you're close to some of the best entrepreneurs in the world. I know you're really good with with Ed. You're yeah. close to Ed. Uh, you're close to Dana. Yeah. You know, Dana's – people see Dana on the UFC, but they fail to realize – how intelligent and how smart he is as a businessman. So smart, man. Bro. And 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 it was really revealed this weekend and I'm really really happy that it happened, but you saw there was $300,000 bonuses yeah. this weekend. Mm -hmm. yeah. So Max Holloway won $600,000 in bonuses. So there's four bonuses, one bonus each for the two guys in the in the fight of the night and then one performance of the night and one knockout of the night. Um, normally they're fifty thousand dollar bonuses, which isn't a bad night at the office for a bonus. One of the reporters asked, "Hey, UFC three hundred, you should up into three hundred thousand." And about one second later, he goes, "Done." And he just that and is badass. It was very badass, and I almost tweeted it. Um, and I talked to Dana a little bit after the fights via kind of voice notes and stuff. But when I was negotiating with Dana, it was he and I, and he made me an offer, and I asked for. I think it was like 30% more, you know, I was like, Dana, what's holding you back from, you know, 30% more. He's like, you know what, kid, fuck it done. And I was just mm. like, and it was, and that's how Dana talks. Right. Yeah. And, uh, that, so hearing the word done, it just, it, it, it made me remember if you bring enough to the table, the problem is don't outpunt your coverage. The mm -hmm. problem is don't, don't take all the meat off the bone, mm -hmm. man. Don't make, make it, a, make it a win for them. And yeah. You. Right. Yeah. Don't it, yeah, make it a make it a win win, man. Mm -hmm. Make it make it so that if you win, they're like, dang, we got a great investment. If you lose, they're like, dang, man, well, at least we didn't at least he didn't come and, and swing for the fence as it, you know. Yeah. So it was really cool. And I what's really funny about Dana and the UFC is I just don't understand, you know, obviously he gets a ton of a ton of flack for not paying the fighters enough and fighter pay and this and that, man. But he's taking care of guys so much better than I think a lot of people even realize. Well, right? also, too, nobody sees the inner – like, people – dude, people think that you get a pr bottle of protein here and it costs you 50 cents and you're selling it for 60 bucks. That, yeah. That's – they when they look at the UFC, they don't think about, you know – all the expense, all the operating costs, all the things that it takes to run a business. They don't, nobody thinks about those things. They just think they they do the math, how many people watched. Yeah. How much was the ticket? How much yeah. was the ticket? Yep. How much are the how much are the the ad revenue? They don't even think about the sponsorship because they don't think that far ahead. Yeah. And then they say, "Okay, well everybody should be making 100 million dollars." Yeah. And it's Every like Every fighter should have 100 yeah, million. Yeah, dude. Now see the superpower that I have and why I think why I have such a great relationship with the, with the UFC and why I will always love the UFC is I have the I have the unique perspective of the other organizations, right? Mm -hmm. and Bellator was the number two organization in the world, and I would watch how the UFC would promote their fights, and I don't think it's crazy to say that the UFC spends more money promoting one fight than Bellator spent the entire year on mm -hmm. promotion. Mm -hmm. The UFC was continuing to elevate the game of mixed martial arts, the whole sport of mixed martial arts. And Bellator, PFL, One Championship, all these other organizations were just rising with the tide mm -hmm. that the UFC was raising. Mm -hmm. um, and I and I said that to Dana, and he actually just uh, he actually just talked to me yesterday about this. Sent me the voice notes. We were kind of telling. He's like, because I basically thanked him. Hey, hey, man, it's been a long journey. Glad we got this thing done. Can't wait to go out there and put on a crazy show on June 29th. And he was kind of reminiscing about my first phone call with Dana. Basically, he was on he was on the tarmac in Las Vegas, about to head out to somewhere. We're talking for like five minutes. We're having a great back and forth conversation. And I and I said this, and and it's. 100% true. It was just as, just as true then as it is now and even five years prior. I said, Dana, number one, I didn't know. I, I don't I don't know if I would have been the man that you needed me to be a couple of years ago when I had these other opportunities, these other opportunities to come over to the UFC. So I'm really happy, happy it's happening right now. 
and you have not paid me $1, you have not signed your name on one of my checks over the last 12 years, but indirectly your name has been on every single one of my checks because you have built and quarterbacked and championed this entire sport. And then Dana's like, oh my God, I love it. He basically hungs up, hangs up on me, calls Hunter, calls me back and he said, hey dude, I know we got some sticking points, but dude, I don't know what you've been saying to my people, but they absolutely love you. I love you. I've always known we've loved you. You're awesome. You're every single thing that we need and we want you to come over. We're going to get you whatever we need to get you to come over to the UFC. And that's how the conversation went. That's bad. And then, and it, but it wasn't, it wasn't a negotiation tactic. It wasn't a ploy. No, it was it genuine. Wasn't, it was, it was yeah. so genuine and it, and it is true, man. Yeah. It's like, and they get they take so much flack, but of course they do because the the tallest nail is always going to get hammered, you mm -hmm. know. And they're going to mm -hmm. continue to get hammered, and they're going to continue to keep looking down while everybody else is is you know trying to grab their Scratch ankles and, and pull claw. them down yeah. instead of trying to just reach up to the next rung. They're trying instead of them reaching themselves up and trying to get themselves to the next rung, they're trying to reach up and pull the UFC down. And that's just never a recipe for success, man. Mm -hmm. And and the way that he operates, man, it's it's uh. It's special, man, and it's yeah. it's a blessing to be a part of it. I think he sets a great example for for a lot of business owners who are afraid to stand for what they believe in yep. and speak for what they believe in. Now, you don't have to agree. I happen to agree. I love Dana White. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Like I, think I we got, all agree in this. I room, got this yeah. little. I got this little note in my phone. You know, because dude, I catch a lot of shit. Right? Like, yeah. You don't say what the, what we say and not catch stuff. You get a little some. A couple the, of armchair quarterbacks. Hey, listen, the best part about it is I've become immune to it. It does right. not affect me. I think the but best part about it is I had this note. What? The people came back, came yeah, back, and like, man, oh, shit, you were right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Well, no, not me. We. Yeah. Yeah. But, but I had this note in my phone. This was like, I don't know, five years ago. And it says, like, for when the, when the heat would come, it would always, it's, it just says very simply, what would Dana White do? What, yeah. would, he, what would he say? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And you know what? I just follow that blue pick. Yeah. I'm yeah. like, you know what? Hey, fuck you. This yeah. is what I do. Dude, if you don't like it, turn the channel. And once again, like it's it's very it's it's very hard for people to see that because they're like, dude, I don't like that guy because he is so confident in himself. Yeah. I don't like because he really does not care. Yeah. Like I don't like him because all the things that I have to deal with, all the thing, all my doubts and fears and insecurities and, that bother and me, all the stuff that bothers me, I don't like him because he doesn't have to deal with what I have to deal with. You know, yeah. and it really is tough. Tougher in 2024 than it was in 1924 because of social media and the world that we live in now and the keeping up with the Joneses and all of this stuff. I will admit and I will concede that it is tougher to live in the world that we live in from that standpoint. From Absolutely. The, from the criticism standpoint. Yeah. It's easier to make yeah, money. Yeah, you, you didn't have to see it back then. Yeah, it's easier to make money. It's easier to be successful. It's easier to do all those things because of the internet and all these different things. But it is very challenging from that perspective. So when we see somebody like that or a guy like yourself, you're like, dang, dude, I don't like him. And it's like, well, do you not like him? Why don't you like them? You just don't like them because you wish you were more like that. I mean, I want to be more like that. Yeah. Everybody wants to be more like that. That is, that is freedom. Yeah, that is, and and that really is. You get this short window of opportunity to live on this earth, mm -hmm. right? And if you can operate the way that he's operating, man. Well, you got to stand in the fire, dude. Like yeah. that's the thing people don't understand. Like when you don't stand in the fire, right? When you don't let the heat come, and yeah. you just censor yourself. First of all, you're degrading your own sense of worth. You're saying, I'm not being authentic. I'm not being who I am for fear of judgment, for fear of criticism. And that will drive your self-esteem, your self-worth, your trust in yourself into the basement because yep. you know you're not presenting what you truly believe. And if you would just stand out in the heat a little bit, it's like getting out in the sun, bro. The first day you get burnt. You're like, oh, man, yeah. I should have put some sunblock on, right? Not really because it causes cancer. I don't need but, it. Uh, <laughs> I don't need it. Yeah. <laughs> I don't. I don't. I don't bro, I get it. darker than you. I actually got burned the other day, actually. Yeah. But, but dude, we're, we're in a situation. You get immune to it. Like you're yeah, yeah. That you get conditioned to it. It's yeah. like a cold plunge. Yeah. Like you, the first time you're in the cold plunge, you're like, Oh, dude, this, yes. this is horrible. And then you you get in it more and more and more and more. And before you know it, you're in there for eight minutes at 35 degrees. And you're like, bro, this is the best part of my day. Yeah. You know, and and dude, so when you get in that situation, if people would just step out and just allow themselves to feel it, eventually you become conditioned to it and it doesn't bother you. It's just like anything else. It's like when you start to go out and train the first yep. day, it's hard. Second day, it's hard. And then it gets like, 
kind of really hard for a minute and then all of a sudden you acclimate and it gets easy yeah and uh and because people can't stand out there and take it the first time or the second time or the third time they don't realize that like if you would just stand there and and stand on your own two feet this stuff would stop stop killing you man yeah and i think and I think you might have been the first person to ever really hear, like, kind of drill it into this this idea of being able to trust yourself. Yeah. Right? This this idea of like self image. How do you have a high self image if you can't trust yourself? I mean, we've 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 talked about it twenty different ways about yeah. doing the small things and setting a certain standard because you know when you're that's another part of it when you when you when you cut corners or you lazy or you you leave your shopping cart sitting over there or you do or you litter whatever that's you know whether you thought about it or not or you felt entitled enough to leave your hotel room a mess because the cleaning lady's going to take care of it mm -hmm. you're you're losing a little bit of trust mm -hmm. with yourself to mm -hmm. get the job done so whether it's fighting in a cage or whether it's running a business or whether it's running a household or whether it's being a parent how are you going to be able to trust yourself in those moments if you know you can't get small little things done? And and that's that's something that I think you 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 just spoke about, but people probably just heard it and didn't. They kind of glossed over it. You really are breaking a promise to yourself every single time you don't stand up for what you believe in. That's right. Every single time that you every single time that you water yourself down. Every single time that you you comp. You, there was I actually uh, had a mindset coach named Jim Hensel. He called it moving the truth. Right. It's kind of like omitting the truth, but you're mm -hmm. moving the truth. Like it's not really the truth, but you're moving the truth. You to make accommodate up, others. Yeah. You make up yeah. you make up a story or you or you you say sorry for this when really you're not sorry because you're, you're doing what you're, you're doing, what it was authentically yourself. You're breaking the trust and promise that you have with yourself and you do it long enough before you know it. You're a shell of the man that you were called to be. And you I owe it to my family. I owe it to yeah. my wife. I owe it to my God, my creator. I owe it to society. And I got I. 100% honest we fail you even you you're you seem like you're and he maybe even Dana every now and then there might be those moments where oh for like, sure you're know, like okay I probably should have just said what I wanted to say there for sure but that's that unlocks things too where you're like okay that Dana's impenet impenetrable he always says what's on his mind I'm sure he's got those moments where yeah but when they become more and more far and few between you're not a hundred thousand percent trustworthy but it's 99.9 percent .9%, and 99.9 yeah. percent .9 is a heck of a place to be yeah dude mm -hmm. you know I, I get criticized a lot for my positions on things in the world obviously but like first of all i don't expect everybody to agree with me that's not the purpose of me sharing them the purpose of me sharing them is to give my take on it right yeah. i feel like i have an, an uh a skill set, a knowledge base. I have enough life experience to give a reasonable take that should be considered. And, you know, people will say to me, they will say, well, why don't you just take it easy on this? Or why don't you just, because dude, if I don't say what I believe to be true, if I do not say exactly what I believe to be true, I am lowering all of the qualities that I need to operate as a human being. Yeah. And if we would just look at it instead of saying, oh, just let people do whatever they want and let, dude, there's limits to that. Yeah. There's limits to this because eventually when we're pacifying other people and moving the truth to your point, we, we do become, we lose our confidence, we lose our swagger, we lose our belief in self that we need to be us. Like you can't walk out in the middle of a ring in front of a hundred million people on television or whatever it is. Right. Mm -hmm. And not think you're the man, bro. Yeah. Like you have to, and it has to be real. Yeah. Yeah. It has to be real dude. And that requires being authentic to self as a baseline foundation. And, um, you know, I think if people would consider what, not being authentic does to their character and does to their belief in themselves, they would be a lot more likely to do so. Yeah. And I, and I think it's kind of what I, what I said earlier, cause I was just thinking about it, how the older you get, you just start caring le less and less. Yeah. And is it that you care less and less, or is it that you know what it feels like to move the truth and not be authentically yourself that eventually you just start to be like, no, wait, why have I done that for yeah. so long? And, and then, and then obviously there's, Usually the older you get, there's more success or the older you get now, maybe you've got a wife and kids and you got people or you got your company has now tripled, quadrupled, mm -hmm. 10x in time mm -hmm. in size. Right. So it doesn't matter. You, you've just got more and more life experience and you care less also because, you know, you used to care and you used to move the truth and you used to pander and you used to water yourself down. And it really was just so inauthentic. Yeah. And it bothered me like it yeah. bo like any time I've ever done that in my life. 
I, I like, dude, I'll remember it forever for like years. Yeah. I'm like, fuck. I can't wait till I see that guy again because I'm going to yeah. tell him the truth this time. That's what I, that's <laughs> what I think. That's I think when I get the maddest. Man. Yeah. It's really hard yeah. for somebody else to steal my joy and, and make me mad at them. Yeah. And it's funny too because me and my wife are very similar, right? Yeah. Like, it, and that's how it is. When she gets her most upset, it's never at anybody else because it's like, dude, someone can't do that. Someone can't do enough to you to make you as mad as you could probably get at yourself when you know you've made a, a mistake or pandered or, man, this is not who I am. Why did I do this? Why mm -hmm. did I just tell him this is what I want? This is how I want it to be. This is how it should be. And I deserve it. Mm -hmm. Not in a cocky, uh, entitled way, but like th this is what way. we got to do. Right. Yeah. You know, and and that's when you get really mad at yourself. Right. And it's and it's uh, that's when I get and I will remember it. Right. Mm -hmm. But it also. Sometimes you need to go through that also too to, to finally to put you back in line. Yeah, yeah, to put you back in line. But also, I feel like sometimes that's a little bit of a an inadvertent. Like you probably shouldn't have let it happen, but each time it does happen, you're getting closer and closer to that person who just doesn't give a heck. Dude. Yeah. You're like, I don't mm -hmm. give a rip, dude. Yeah. You know, and yeah. it helps you. And it doesn't mean you got to be. A, it doesn't mean you're gonna take advantage of people, be a bad person, not a person of integrity, do bad things. You're doing really, really good things, but I'm just not going to sacrifice who I am and how I do things. That's right. Yeah. You know, I want to ask you this, man. Like, like, give me a give me a straight fucking answer. The first time that Bruce announced you, how was that, dude? My my first experience of fighting in the UFC was. I've had some really, really, really great moments in my entire career, but that one was extra extra special so i mean yeah i get this getting chills, chills, getting chills thinking about it because yeah when it happened because it's one of those deals where i've watched the ufc from afar from so long mm -hmm. and i've got to be honest with you i've done interviews where i'm like yeah i deserve to be in the ufc but i didn't really truly believe it you know when i was a little bit younger and then i, I needed to get to the point where i finally believed it and i deserved it and i knew i i almost forced the door to open about four or five years ago because I, I went through three different contract renewals or four different contract renewals with UFC or with Bellator each time I was going to have the opportunity to become a free agent take a chance and go to the UFC and each time it just never felt like the right time until it felt like the exact right time which was you know 2020 when it mm -hmm. happened and I was taking a chance on myself I was leaving relative I was leaving relative security Bellator loved me they were paying me very well I was going to come over to the UFC I thought I was going to take a pay cut Turns out I did not take a pay cut, and I was very pleasantly surprised. Um, but I was still taking a chance. I still – there's a lot of people who were like – I mean, you know, and even my wife, you know, for, for years it's like, well, we got a great thing going, but I want you to do what you want to do. And I was like, yeah, babe, but if I go there, if I go to and barbecue, it's over. I'm getting cut. She's <laughs> like, is that what you want to do? I'm like, yeah, that's what I want to do because I wasn't going to be able to lay my I, – I pictured the 40-year-old me, the 42-year-old me retired – Laying in bed at night, and I just cannot get comfortable because my head is laying on this 40-pound cinder block of why did you not go test yourself against the best guys, the biggest, the baddest, the best guys in the world? Why did you not take a chance on yourself? You walked on to Mizzou. Nobody knew who you were. Everyone from High Ridge, Missouri was like, hey, dude, why don't you just go to Missouri Baptist or why don't you just go to CMSU? They're offering you scholarship. You did it back then. How could how could eighteen year old Michael make that choice? But thirty four year old Michael can't make that choice after all of God's faithfulness, after all the things that you've done, right? But that moment when I was walking out there to that first fight in the UFC, man, you can just see the joy. Like it was, it was. I knew I was right where I was supposed to be. I would, and I had zero doubts whatsoever, which most of the time I do. Luck, luckily, walking into the cage, but that was. It was a special, special night. And Dan Hooker's number five in the world. Knock him out in the first two and a half minutes. He had just went 25 minutes with Dustin Poirier, the number two guy in the world at that point. And yeah, Bruce announcing the name and finally watching the UFC from afar, hearing Bruce Buffer from afar all those years. And now he's saying, Iron Michael Chandler, man. It's, uh, it was pretty crazy. Dude, <clears throat> we're going to wrap it up because I, I, uh, we got some other stuff to do too. Yeah, we got some other stuff. Yeah. But, S'mores party. S'mores. We got <laughs> s'mores to eat. Listen to this guy. So, dude, let me, before we go, I'd like, I'd like to close with, with just one thing. Um, what's, what's your message to Connor? I'm just kidding. <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> Let's go. <laughs> you know, actually, I, I would actually like to clear something up. So yeah. I actually, uh, I got to ask this uh, a little while back before the fight was announced and whatever, like, what's the message to Connor? 
you know, Ed and I have been talking about this a lot, mm-hmm. and he's like, the thing we're going to hammer home, Michael, is that you have earned this. Mm-hmm. You really, really have. And I know there's got to be a tiny little part of you, that little guy from that little town who was taught to do little things that I always talk about. He's still in there, and there's a part of you that's like, hey, man, yeah, you're here, but you haven't earned it. You don't deserve it, right? And I'm like, yeah, no, there's there's that there's always that little inkling in all of us, right? And he's like, but we got to hammer home that you earned this, right? You have, yeah. And, and I and I and I and I answered this question um, a couple weeks ago, and I was getting a little bit of hate for for it because it kind of came off like, hey, Connor hasn't earned it, and I have earned it. We must be very clear. Connor McGregor was the best thing for mixed martial arts ever, ever in the yeah. history of the sport. He has built the sport. He he I'm making more money because of him. The next fighter's making more money because of him. More people know us because of him. He's elevated the sport. The UFC has done a lot of that as well. Conor McGregor has earned every single thing that he's ever gotten. He's probably earned more. He probably could have made more had there not been some other things, decisions that he has made. He has done every single thing that he needs to do to be exactly where he is at. But when it comes to the last couple years, when it comes to who's going to put more work in, who has been putting more work in, who has been more steadfast, more immovable, more disciplined, I'm the guy who has earned it, right? That's fast. I'm, I'm the guy who, hmm. stepping into that cage, when I do finish him and, and his eyes roll back in the back of his head, I'm not going to feel anything, but I am very, very blessed, man, and I earned this and I deserve this, and I think I finish him in the second round. Let's go. Oh, All right, one thing. For, this is what I was really going to ask. <laughs> Sorry. I, I, I love, love it. it. I just love hijacked. It. I just hijacked you. No, no, no. I love it. But what I really want to ask, because I think it's important, because we have a lot of young, hungry, ambitious people that listen to the show. If you could go back from where you are now, and you said earlier, you couldn't see that 15-year-old connecting the dots to be where you are now. What would your message be to the young men and the young women and that 15-year-old Michael Chandler who is filled with uncertainty and uncertain about the path and really can't connect the dots. They know they want to get somewhere, but they're not sure how to do it. What would that message be? Man, I think the message is going to be it's all going to work out and never, ever, ever grow weary in doing good. People are going to try to put you into a box. People are going to tell you that you have to live your life this way. You have to talk like this. You have to walk like this. You have to do this. You have to act like this. These are the things. This is what society says that you have to do. This is what we say you need to do. This is what your parents say you need to do. This is what your friends say you need to do. There's going to be all of these conflicting things and then you're going to get into your path and then there's going to be even more people talking and 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 the road to wherever way you're going to go and there's going to be so much uncertainty cuz you're you're not quite sure how to build it if you step on that square right there is it a foothold is it going to fall out underneath you or is it going to take you to the next step you're not quite sure all you can do is boil it all the way back down distill it all the way back down to just operating with integrity and doing the best becoming the best version of yourself brick by boring brick and doing the small little things because yeah when i was younger um if if you would have told me that i was going to be sitting here on the cusp of 75 days away from the pinnacle of what mixed martial arts is um i would have thought you were absolutely crazy i would have i would have told you right there don't you bring don't you br- bring that energy toward me right now because i feel like you're lying to me there is no way that that is going to happen and then Eventually, you get to the point where you look back at that 15-year-old boy and you think, man, I'm so proud of you for never giving up. And I'm proud of you for making those decisions. I'm proud of you for walking on. I'm proud of you in the face of adversity. You pulled yourself back up. I'm proud of you for the way that you've operated. And I'm proud of you for never, ever wavering. Because it's going to be the things that kept you small the things that suppressed you. It's going to be the things that held you down that will eventually springboard you into something that is so much bigger than you ever thought could ever, ever be possible. You're going to get the opportunities for the big, big things because of the things that kept you small, Mm -hmm. because of the things that held you down, because of the things that you hated yourself for and the way that you did operate and how you were afraid and the fear and the doubt and all of that. All of that stuff is the reason you're going to get this opportunity. 
So just stay steadfast in that. And as long as you're doing what you can do, as long as you're doing the best that you can do, it might not be tomorrow, it might not be next week, but eventually the hard work will pay off, but you still have to be standing there to receive it when it does. Bro, I love that, man. Dude, thank you so much, man. This has been an awesome conversation. Uh, this has been an amazing show. It's one of my favorite conversations we've ever had. Thank you. And uh, 75 days, bro. 75 days. I, I give you my word. I'm going to go as hard as I can go for the next 75 dude. days. Just, just to support. That's going to be my way to support. All right. And I know there's going to be a lot of people listening that will do the same. We're going to get behind you in this fight. Heck so yeah, dude. Um, I would say good luck, but I don't think you need it. I know you're going to show up every day and I know you're going to do the work. Uh, brother, I'm proud to be your friend. I'm proud to have you as part of first form. I'm proud of who you are as a man. And, uh, you're a great example for, for everybody listening, including myself and bro. And I just appreciate you, man. Thank you, bro. It's an honor, honor to be here. Thank you for this. And I'm proud to be part of first form and what you have created here because I am extremely, extremely proud of it. Well, it's day one, bro. Day one, baby. That's right. Day, day one. All right, guys, that's the show. Uh, I appreciate you guys. I love you guys. And uh, don't be a hoe. Share the show. <laughs>